What's going on, guys? Welcome to the Creating Wealth Podcast, where I, Kyle, from Kyle Curtin Real Estate, interview local top dogs in the real estate investing, wealth building, and personal finance industries. Let's build together. What's up, guys? The guest on this week's episode of the podcast has done some really awesome and out-of-the-box strategies with many different forms of leverage in his entrepreneurial career thus far. John has used different vehicles like real estate, credit cards, and putting yourself and your brand out there and given value on social media to do some really big things so far. This interview was super informative and I hope you enjoy. Let's jump right into the episode. What's up, guys? Welcome to episode 45 of the Creating Wealth podcast today. I have the great pleasure of chatting with John Lang, an absolutely incredible personal finance teacher, YouTuber, and real estate investor. John knows how to do insane things with credit cards, from booking free flights to countries all over the world worth thousands of dollars, and so much more. What's going on, John? How's everything going, man? What is new? Kyle, it is a pleasure. I appreciate the <laughs> intro, my man. Oh, I don't think I could have written it any any better myself. Um, no, it's it's good to reconnect again. You know, I've definitely been listening to your podcast, so I'm really excited uh, to kind of share with your audience. Obviously, some of the the learnings that I myself have learned kind of through the years. Obviously, kind of through the travel hacking game and extending now more into personal finance, and of course, our our favorite real estate. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. I'm very excited to uh, likewise talk with you as well. And uh, yeah, you know, hear more of your story and and we can jump right in. For sure. So yeah, so there's, there's actually quite a bit. I'm pretty excited. I have to kind of find a point to start. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so I mean, we could kind of start off with, uh, you know, what do you do, um, you know, in terms of like your day job? And then maybe we can start to kind of get into like the travel hack and stuff and the real estate, the floor is all yours. <laughs> all right. Yeah. I mean, even jumping into a day job, it, it is a bit of a story. And I do want to kind of share with your audience how I got to where I am. So today I am in enterprise software sales, which is essentially I'm selling large, fairly complex um, software solutions to big businesses. Um, but if I told you what my major was in college, you wouldn't believe it. So I actually started out uh, my undergrad as, as a pre-med major thinking I was going to go to medical school. Fast forward a couple of years after undergrad, decided, you know what? Medical school is not the way for me. And I actually then quickly pivoted and went to pharmacy school. I know. It, <laughs> I don't, it, was like, it was like the no-brainer. Like, you know, we're not going to do medicine, so we'll do pharmacy. So I got my undergrad, did bio and psych, started two years of pharmacy school. After two years of pharmacy school, quickly realized, you know, this isn't it for me. This, this isn't it for me. It's, it was interesting, but not necessarily what I saw myself doing as a profession. And so it was my second year of pharmacy school. And this was the year where basically after two years of pharmacy school, your last two years are considered graduate years where you're paying $50,000 a year, period. And I looked at it as kind of a math problem. I thought, well, stick around. I'll pay 50,000 over two years. So it's about $100,000 um, on top of the student that I already had. And then it'll kind of be a bit of a climb to catch up. Or what if I just left now and just started working right away? Because at this point, I'd already be, been in school for six years and I had three undergrad degrees. So again, I was kind of pretty much done. And, and so <laughs> that year, I gave myself an ultimatum, find a job or continue. Luckily, I found a job. I found a job in pharmaceutical sales. I found a job in pharmaceutical sales, did that for two years, and then and eventually ended up pivoting over into the tech space. So a bit of a long-winded way of saying kind of where I got, but really, I guess the, the point of that is just to say, when you're starting out, you're 18, you're in college, you think you know what you want to do for the rest of your life? No. You likely don't. <laughs> you likely very, you likely don't, and you kind of end up kind of, you know, end up where life takes you. Um, so that's kind of my day job now. Uh, and then in addition to that, you alluded to earlier with the YouTube and obviously the real estate, all that is, you know, things that I've done on top of it. Um, as far as real estate, so I primarily uh, am a long-term buy and hold investor. Um, I'm actually currently now in a multifamily property that I bought last year. It's a two-family in the Boston area. And this year, my girlfriend and I were actually looking for our second property. Very different market landscape this year than it was a year ago. But mm -hmm. nonetheless, um, that's kind of how we approach it is basically long-term buy and hold. 
Uh, and then on top of that, obviously we've got the real estate going on as well. I mean, sorry, on top of that, we also have the YouTube going on as well. And that's just more of a side hustle, right? Really getting, I guess, diversified streams of income um, and seeing what I can do and really just offer things that I've learned along this journey, right? Whether it's real estate, personal finance, or credit cards, and just kind of offer it as a service um, out to the rest of the world. Because I think there's some valuable lessons to be learned um, and some good stories to share from that. I totally agree, man. I, I absolutely love your YouTube channel. Guys, definitely, I'll shout it out later on and stuff, but yeah. definitely check out John's YouTube channel. What What's the name of it again, John? I apologize. Uh, it's just John Liang, that's it. John Perfect. Liang, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's really awesome, guys. Yeah, the amount of information that that John has, you know, has learned and is, you know, like literally just given out, you know, for the masses to learn is is absolutely incredible. Um, yeah, that's that's quite the transition. That's awesome. You know, from going from kind of like the medical industry to like a hybrid between, you know, like a medical and a sales, and then into a tech. That's incredible. You know, yeah. and then to really just kind of venture out into you know, starting your own side hustles and YouTube. And uh, that's, that's absolutely awesome, man. Yeah, I mean, even if I could just double back on that, I think that it's pretty critical, because I mean, I myself, so uh, my parents were immigrants to this into this country, right. And so, especially within the Asian American, I would say community, right, you really have three options when you go to college, are you going to be a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. And a lot of that is rooted in kind of what our parents sacrificed to come here. And for them, the ultimate payoff is, is basically what would be kind of a financial success, right? And, and so, but, but it kind of uh, expresses itself in, I guess, professions that are, I don't know, thought of as maybe higher. Not, not that it is, but that's kind of how it's perceived in the community. And so there was a bit of going in that, you know, maybe a little bit of pressure, but it was never, my parents never told me, but I always felt like, oh, well, if I want to do something and I want to make money, well, I shouldn't just say I want to make money, even though these professions pay a lot. I, I should be, you know, it should be something that helps people and there's job security and then all of that. And part of the journey that I've realized is it's not bad or really a negative thing. If at the end of the day, you, what you want from your job is to make money, because at the end of the day, like, yes, making a certain threshold you're not going to be any happier, right? I think there's some Princeton study out there. After you make $75,000, people aren't that much happier with each additional marginal dollar. But at the same time, having a solid financial footing allows you to do a lot more, gives you a lot more sense, sense of security as well as freedom. And so all that is to say, you know, kind of the realization pharmacy school is kind of like, well, you know, there is... There is uh, what I'm leaving behind would be kind of security and almost this kind of guaranteed paycheck. But on the flip side of it, you know, positioning into sales, I'll definitely be able to, you know, kind of give myself that sense of financial, I guess, security, if you will, and building that financial foundation so that later down in, in, so that later down in line, I can kind of do more of what it is that I, that I want, right? Without necessarily feeling as if I'm really tied to this, to a W-2 or whatever it may be. Um, that's just kind of the philosophy I've, I've kind of approached things with. Yeah, that's definitely a really good one, you know, and just to, just to kind of adapt that and, and be able to, yeah, you know, just kind of carry things out and, and kind of go down that path is, is amazing. <laughs> yeah. So John, what is kind of your drive and your vision for the long term? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, vision for the long term, I'll be honest with you, I, I want to have the option to be retired by the time of 40. I mean, if I look at it, um, you know, I think we're, you know, in a position, you and I, and especially folks that are kind of attuned to, you know, the real estate world or even kind of having side hustles where, hey, if I can put a little bit more away in the bank, if I can invest a little bit more, then it looks like I can accelerate the timeline in which I can retire. Because let's be honest, at the end of the day, you know, when most people think of retirement, it's, it's kind of when you're at the almost end stages of your life and you're starting to enjoy the fruits of your labor. But for me, you know, the driving force is, well, why can't that happen sooner? If you're in a position to realize, hey, if I were to just save a little bit more, if I were to leverage vehicles like real estate or the stock market to, you know, grow my wealth a little bit more, could I accelerate this timeline from what would be the age of 63 to maybe 53 to maybe 43? And when I'm at that point, I'm not thinking just sitting on the beach and sipping, you know, pina coladas. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> things that, you know, are a little bit more interesting to me. So for example, I was talking to my girlfriend about this. Um, 
in, in terms of, I don't know if you've heard of the term FIRE, right? Financial independence, retire early. I'm like, I like the, the, the FI, the FI part of that. But the retire early part is going and doing things that we really enjoy. Both of us, avid scuba divers. We both have our advanced scuba license. We've done over 150 dives each. And one of the things that, you know, that we're really passionate about um, are actually core reefs. And I kind of pitched it to him. I'm like, wouldn't it be really cool if at some point we could go and just, you know, whether it be seasonal or, or kind of like in a temporary state, go to one of these coral reefs and do some like coral farm planting. I mean, that's really cool. It kind of combines what we love, scuba diving, with, you know, doing something that to us seems very, very impactful. Now, that's certainly just one example. But when you're tied to a W-2 that's a nine to five, very difficult to take a month or two off. Yeah. And so I, I think it's, it's the philosophy is that's, that's really the driving force is like, can I, what can I do in my power today to accelerate the timeline in which I can basically, you know, kind of start doing more of exactly what it is I want. Now, that's not to say that I don't plan to do that kind of between now and whenever that time is, of course, the goal that we put out there is 40, but it's just more to say, can I accelerate it? Because you obviously still want to be living now and not just yeah. saving every single last <laughs> dollar, you know, living on ramen um, until then. <laughs> a bit of a long-winded way to answer it, but that's kind of the, the driving, I guess, the driving force of the philosophy kind of when I'm approaching any type of new either investment vehicle, side hustle, um, obviously real estate acquisition, all of that. That's really cool, man. I, I really love that why. You know, and I forget exactly what the phrase is. I'm probably going to butcher it, but like retirement, I've, I've been obsessed with it since I heard it. Um, retirement isn't age, it's money. So yeah. I just, that just like immediately came to my head, you know, when you were kind of telling that, um, explaining that vision and everything, you know, like just to be able to drop that, you know, that age down through these uh, asset classes that you're able to leverage, you know, like the real estates, the stock markets, and just to be able to kind of continually drop that retirement number down. You know, I really like what you said as well, you know, from like going hard, but also, you know, having that medium of enjoying the time from now to then, you know, and like still staying happy and everything and like, you know, enjoying our young age and stuff. And uh, yeah, you know, like, just kind of finding that medium in between like really trying to get that vision as fast as possible, but also enjoying getting there at the same time, you know, and not necessarily like sacrificing too much or just enjoying the ride. That's exactly it, man. You, you nailed it. It's, it's, if you can do something in your power, again, that's for me, right? If I can do something in that power to excel at the timeline, that's great. If I fall short of that, it's still probably better than waiting till I'm 63. And then exactly. in the process, make sure you're taking it all in because you don't want to get to 10, 20 years down the road and be like, oh, well, I haven't lived. And now all of a sudden I've got to live now. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> you, you summarize it perfectly, man. That, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> I really like that goal that you have too with the scuba diving. I've never been scuba diving before. It, it sounds absolutely incredible. Oh, it's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> once you get in, it, 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 I describe it as, you know, for example, you might go on a nature walk, you enter the woods, you hear birds, you, you know, you know, there are animals rustling around. When you're underwater, it's like that, except you just can see all of them. I mean, it feels like you're in a real life aquarium. We've done some pretty amazing dives. The Galapagos, we went diving with, um, it was hammerhead season. So we went diving with hammerheads. That was really, really cool. What? Always. Yeah, I know. It was, it was <laughs> nuts. It was nuts. And the thing about sharks, I will say, actually, very skittish. So with hammers, you actually can't, if you're below them and you blow bubbles, they'll actually just disperse. So you have to come on top of them, but as soon as you swim towards them, they're gone. Um, so yeah, sharks. So sharks are actually tougher to find than you would think, um, mostly because they, they're more afraid of you um, than, than maybe you are of them, although some people are probably pretty terrified of, uh, <laughs> of sharks. That's really interesting though. That's crazy. Yeah. So have you been on dives like around the world or like just in like, like, is there a I guess kind of one area that that really has like blown you away. Yeah, actually, I, I you know I feel like I feel like I shouldn't give away the secret, but <laughs> so we've gone and just to kind of give myself a little credibility as far as where I've gone. Um, so Great Barrier Reef, um, Philippines, Thailand, Bali, the Galapagos, uh, Mauritius, which is this tiny island off the east coast of um, Madagascar, um, and where else? Oh, Sydney, of course, Sydney, of course, and taking a look at all of those areas, right, including the Great Barrier Reef. The Philippines has some of the, actually, and, oh, and Hawaii as well. The Philippines has some of the best coral, period. Um, obviously, you know, we've got issues with global warming, corals getting bleached, and it really is pretty apparent when you get down there. 
But in contrasting all of those locations, the Philippines, I would still say, is some of the best coral um, that I've seen. And the thing with having good coral is you have a ton of marine life down there. So if That's anyone's looking cool. to get in a dive, the Philippines. I also like to plug the Philippines as kind of the, the common man's Maldives because you've got the amazing, right? The tropical waters, you've got the kind of the overwater villas, but you pay a fraction of the price that you would um, if you were to go out to the Maldives. That's incredible. So we'll pro tip for y'all. You'll have to do a little bit of research after this. <laughs> oh yeah, man. My friend's got a round trip, round trip ticket, um, JFK to Manila for 437 a person. Oh wow. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean that's that's on a on a on a busy season. That's probably a Boston to SF San Francisco flight. So wow. It's cheap. No, it's, it's cheap. <laughs> is that like a direct flight or is it like one of those uh like the RTW ticket things? I don't know. Uh it's it's a round trip. It's a round trip. So yeah. you I think they connected through Shanghai. Uh, I, oh, okay. I, yeah, it wasn't direct. If you want to fly direct into the Philippines, you'd have to be on the West Coast. Oh, gotcha. It, yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, there was, um, I forget, somebody was telling me about it a while back. It's, uh, it's like this kind of plane ticket. I, I haven't really looked into it much, but it's like this plane ticket called like an RTW, like around the world. Ticket. Oh, and- yep. Yeah, somebody like explained the concept to me a while back and I was pretty blown away. You know, just getting like one ticket and having like, you know, from here to like Sydney or something and then having like a bunch of smaller locations like in between, like to be able to see like a lot of different things. Yeah, no, that that's actually, yeah. So that is, it's around the world ticket. So the best way to do that is actually using points. So mm-hmm. kind of, I'll keep it pretty high level for, for the audience. But if you had, let's say about 120,000 miles uh, you could book an around the world ticket with all night on airways where I believe you can stop at, I think between anywhere from six to eight countries. And the only stipulation is you fly one way. So you're not going to be able to double back, but you fly one way. So think about that. You're hitting six to eight countries on 120,000 points. Um, to get those 120,000 points, you really need one credit card, maybe two and a little bit of spend. Um, and I mean, retail value, right? That's I don't know. A ridiculous uh, amount of money. Yeah, yeah. much <laughs> thousands. So <Yeah. laughs> no, you nailed it, man. That's uh, that's actually kind of a dream redemption is to be able to do that all all in um, a premium cabin. So like a business, actually, ideally a business. First is very, very difficult. Um, but business would be really, really cool. Wow. That's awesome. So what yeah. was kind of like the, what kind of got you into, um, you know, like the credit cards and like the travel hacking and stuff? Like what kind of gave you the spark? Yeah, we'll, we'll bring it back to college. So uh, <laughs> as far as, yeah, so it's pretty interesting how I, and I didn't, I kind of stumbled across this. So in college, I never really worked during the school year. I would always work in the summertime, but obviously during college, you spend money during the school year. So one thing I kind of just stumbled across was credit cards, but not necessarily leveraging um, debt, using credit cards that had a 0% promotional um, APR. So here's how credit cards work at a very high level, right? You charge it. And if you don't pay it off, you have to pay interest rates on whatever the balance is. With a credit card that has a 0% promotional APR, you can actually hold a balance and there's no interest. And so a lot of these cards had anywhere from 16 to 18 months where there is no interest. And so I kind of did a little back napkin math. I was like, okay, well, I know, I forgot what the figure was, but I know I make a certain amount over the summer. As long as I don't spend more than that during the school year, then I will be able to pay off the cards. And so I would front load my spend onto those credit cards, you know, make the minimum payment, which was like maybe like 35 bucks. And in the summertime, I would work, take all those paychecks, pay off the credit cards. And that's how I did it. I did it over two summers. And, and that's what got me interested in credit cards. I'm like, this is a pretty interesting vehicle, right? I'm basically taking out a loan. At the time, I didn't think of it as a loan. I was just like, oh, this is kind of like free money that I don't have today, but I will have in the future. Yeah. Um, I do caution though. Don't do it with any cards that have a high interest rate. <laughs> when you're, if you're paying 19, 26, 30 percent interest, that's that's a no bueno. So certainly not. But that's how I ended up getting started. Um, I got started on the, on that, and then after graduation, I didn't do a ton until 2016 when Chase uh, released their Chase Sapphire Reserve. The Chase Sapphire Reserve is kind of the, I guess, the premier travel car. And at the time, it kind of broke the travel game because of the sign-up bonus. It was 100,000 points um, at the time, which was kind of unheard of. And the travel perks were insane, right? You get things like 
is airport lounge access, which means they're, they're the place that I always thought rich people and fancy people got to go because <laughs> they fly a lot and spend a lot of money. <laughs> Not the case. Uh, you just needed a credit card that would give you access. And that, I trust me, my man, it changes the game of how you travel because suddenly it's like, all right, I'm not just rushing to the gate, trying to get a seat, getting my cold cut sandwich and just waiting. Yeah. Go to a lounge, relax, chill. Um, completely changes the travel game. But anyway, that card got me into it. And then from there on out, it was just, these points are very valuable. There's amazing ways to just spend a couple, I mean, maybe 100,000 points, 50,000 points, whereas the retail value of these tickets, five, 10, $15,000, which I would never in yeah. a million years pay that. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's quite literally a down payment. Let, let's just put that, let's just put that. Yeah. $15,000, that, that's a down payment, right? On, so, but that, that's kind of how I got started. Yeah, kind of, in, I kind of, I guess, inadvertently, like didn't realize I was getting to travel hacking as it's termed now, uh, more so the 0% interest APR and then got lured in by the Chase Sapphire Reserve. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible, man. Like just to be able to kind of use that strategy, you know, in college, like just to be able to use those kind of credit cards as a tool to, you know, like, I guess, stay afloat, you know, at the time for like to fit the given situation and everything. That's wow. <laughs> it You're right. It essentially is, you know, just taking a loan that you can pay back, you know, when you have the money, you know, and you're all good, you know, just keep exactly. track of it and stuff and, and you're golden. Wow. As long as you make sure that you understand that that intro promo that expires at the end of 16, 18 months. You don't want to be at month 19 and be like, oh, I've oh, got no. $2,000 <laughs> and now I'm accruing, accruing 20% interest on. But yeah, that, that's exactly it. it. It's always, for me, it's always been, you know, how can I, because here's the thing with our, with money, right? Whenever you exchange your dollar, you should always try to get something in return because otherwise, why are you spending it? And so if you think about it in that context, right, it makes perfect sense with credit cards. Every dollar you spend, you should get something back for it. Yeah. Um, so that's the other thing. That I'm, big, I'm a big value guy. And that once I realized, hey, if I you know, spend a dollar here and I can get 2%, 3% back, amazing. And then when I redeem, I can get maybe 10, 20% of value per the dollar. Kind of a Perfect. no-brainer. Yeah. 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 <laughs> wow. That's a wicked cool tool. Oh, my God. Yeah, no, it's it, it's something that I think everyone should look at, at least maybe having one or two cards, right? It, it's not too complicated. I would say I definitely do it to an extent that's a little bit more quote unquote advanced, but really it's just understanding understanding how the game works. That's it. That, that's really all it is. I don't have any cheat codes. I wasn't taught this by my parents. It was very much, hey, I like this, read it, scroll. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so now with those, like the, the, the Chase Sapphire cards and stuff, is that like, is it like the points and stuff, do they like expire or is it just kind of like the promotions that, that expire? Yeah. So, so it's really the promotions that will expire. So when it comes to those points, um, so broadly speaking, there, are, I would say three major banks, right? So you have Chase Bank, you have American Express and you have Citibank. Um, the smaller ones, you've got Barclays, you've got Capital One, but I'm just going to count the three big ones because there's more of an ecosystem around them. Yeah. Um, none of those points never expire. So you earn your chase points, they'll never expire. So say you, and I would say ecosystem, because with most of those banks, there's multiple cards that allow you to pool in points. So in that instance, right, unlike a, a Bank of America card, I believe where there might be only one card that you're earning points to, and it's not bucketed and it's direct cash back or a discover card, that's just direct cash back. With Chase, you've got your Chase Freedom line, you've got your Chase Sapphire line, you've got your Chase Inc line for the businesses, and all those points can pull together, which is pretty incredible, right? Now, all of a sudden, you have got, you basically are able to maximize your spend across many different categories. Because yeah. say some are better for travel, some are better for groceries, some are better for your business expenses, but even still, you're just accumulating all of those points into one system and those points never expire. That's absolutely incredible. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's, it, it's pretty crazy. Once you kind of figure that out and then you figure out the true value of those points, are going to come from transferring them. So most people, they get cash back. They're like, hey, I've got 2% cash back. That's awesome. And that's certainly good in some situations where people need the cash back. But for me, I'm thinking, okay, I've got 2% cash back. You know, instead of taking these 50,000 points and getting back, I usually you'll get back maybe 500 bucks, flip those 50,000 points and maybe get $1,000 worth of value by transferring it to a flight partner and booking an airline flight. Oh, um, okay. Where that, yeah. So that's really where you get the value. Like most people are going to get like 
kind of, I guess, the very direct cash back value, like that's really easy conceptually. But where you get the most bang for your buck is when you start transferring to an airline and then making a booking, especially for an international long haul ticket in a premium class. I know it's very specific, but that's really (laughs) where you get the most bang for your buck. If anyone's wondering, man, I've got 100,000 points. How do I get the most value for that? Um, I would say, see, you know, where do you want to go and where do you want to go while sipping on champagne and knocking back caviar at 30,000 feet? Because that's where you're going to get the most value. <laughs> wow. That is unbelievable, man. Oh my God. Yeah. I definitely have some research to do. <laughs> yeah. Let me know. I'm uh, happy to walk you through it anytime. I mean, I, I kind of tell my friends this all the time. Whenever you guys are ready for a trip, give me 18 months in advance. I will write down, you know, kind of a two or three card tier, two or three card system, and uh, we'll just map it out. And that's it. That's really all it is. But unfortunately, I think unlike most folks, I think I, I book pretty far in advance and I just kind of keep it. I think if you're doing last minute bookings, it can be harder to extract out the long haul international premium cabin. But if you want to do short term, I mean, sorry, if you want to do um, just like regular economy, that's no problem. So here's an example. Uh, I had to book a last minute ticket from Boston to Sydney uh, to visit my girlfriend. And I had uh, two weeks. No, actually, it was a week before departure. Tickets were going for about $2,400 cash, uh, which is just absolutely insane to me. I ended up transferring my Chase United, uh, my Chase points over to United Airlines. And I booked using the United Airlines award chart. I spent 80,000 points and I believe it was maybe like a hundred (laughs) bucks. So, I mean, you know, over 2000 (laughs) to about a hundred bucks, like it's, yeah. And you're not going to be able to, so that's when you get a ton of value if you're just booking an economy, like, Hey, last minute, boom, let's go zip zip. Yeah. Wow. That's so crazy, man. Oh my God. (laughs) Yeah. There's trust me. There's a lot of crazy, funky things you can do once you start getting into getting into the game. (laughs) Wow. So to segue right off of that. John, how do you define wealth? Yeah, I mean, I would say, I'd say, I'd say wealth is really just the ability to do what you want at, at, at whatever time it is you might want to do it, right? I think those that are truly wealthy, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a dollar figure. I think people very much get caught up in this idea of it has to be, I've got to have $100,000 in the bank or a million or 10 million or 100 million. And, and really, I see it as, hey, if you are happy and content and you have the freedom and time to be able to do what it is you want day to day, I'd say hats off to you. You are a wealthy individual. Because yeah. if we think about the uber wealthy, most people are just thinking of people who are really rich. And, and really what they're thinking of, the, you know, people who are very, very rich and have a ton of financial resources at their hands, they also probably have a lot of time. It, you know, yeah. if you had $100 million in the bank and you suddenly decided that, hey, you know what, I'm not going to go to work. I'm just going to go do whatever I want to do, you can do it. And so it's, it's really that trade-off of, right, of money for time. And so then why don't we just get right to it? Well, eh, if we could knock off the money part, if we don't need a hundred million, if we only need, you know, a fraction of that, but you know, we can have the time, then I would say, Perfect. You're, you know, hats off to you. You, you are a wealthy individual. Yeah. <laughs> I love that, man. That's so true. You know, even like you said, you know, to like, just be able to accomplish, uh, you know, like your vision in particular. You know, just to be able to to go on like, you know, a lot of these trips and, um, you know, be able to like visit all the coral reefs and stuff and, and be able to kind of build those up and stuff just whenever you want, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah, just. <laughs> yep. Wow. <laughs> um, ooh. What is something that you thought about business networking or wealth creation that has kind of changed as you went along? So I don't know if it's necessarily changed, but it's been reaffirmed uh, is that having a strong network truly pays dividends. And I think as you're growing up, people say, you know, it's your, your network is your net worth. And it's probably not something that really resonates until I think you really start putting yourself out there more. Uh, and, and the prime example of that would be kind of, kind of how we ended up buying this multifamily. So when we first started out our search, you know, we, I'm trying to think how we found our first agent. I think it was off of, yeah, it was, it was off of Bigger Pockets. I found an agent off Bigger Pockets, real estate agent, as well as uh, my friend's mom. Now, 
not a knock on both of them. They were both amazing agents, but I don't think it was we quite clicked in what it is that we were looking for. Mm-hmm. And so how we found our current agent today was actually going to a networking event. It was a meetup event um, where I met a, now actually I would say a really good friend and you might know him, Avery. Yeah. And he introduced me. Yeah, a- Avery's awesome. And he introduced me to a real estate agent that he had used to buy his first property. And I mean, hey, this guy is phenomenal. Taylor Johnson in the Boston area. I'll give him a shout out because he's just is <laughs> absolute king of his craft. And very quickly, you know, we connected. He kind of saw properties, the same lines that we were looking at properties. And pretty soon, I would say within, honestly, uh, I would say a month and a half of hard looking, boom, offer in, offer accepted. Um, and I don't think that would have happened had we not put ourselves in there and gone to this, right, this meetup. Uh, I remember still thinking, I was like, oh, you know, I don't know about this meetup. I mean, I think we're doing pretty good. And then we go, you know, we meet these great people, like-minded, and introduce me, you know, introduce us to their agent. And, you know, long story short, that's how we ended up buying a multifamily, which is a pretty huge ROI if you think about, hey, I just went to have a beer at a meetup. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's something that's certainly, um, yeah, that's that's probably been reaffirmed as as we go forward just realizing how important it is right it's really just who you know and who they know that's probably the easiest way because at the end of the day you could reach out to people online any given day and it'll be a crapshoot of whether or not there's going to be you know real value in that relationship but if you kind of take the time build a network start talking to individuals kind of start putting yourself out there whatever it is that you're looking for right whether it's you want coaching you want to talk about financial independence, you want to talk about real estate, whatever it is, start putting yourself out there and you'd be surprised at what comes back. Yeah, I totally agree, man. You know, like it really is crazy too. like, you know, something like as small as just going to like a meetup, you know, and like you said, you know, like just kind of with the rough intention of like, you know, just getting out for the night, talking to some people, having a drink or two, whatever, like something like that can literally change your life. You know, like it, it's like unbelievable when Absolutely. it happens too, or even like just one phone call or something you know oh, like it's yeah. it's it's crazy like how how small and quick something can be to change like your whole entire direction altogether you know it's it happens like more frequently than than not i feel like you know i mean i feel like the obviously the more you put yourself out there the more something like that's going to happen and like you said you know like also like you never know who's going to kind of come out of the woodwork after you put yourself out there and be like, Hey man, you know, I didn't know you were into that kind of thing. Like, you know, let's, let's shoot the breeze. Like I'm into that same kind of thing. You know, I have these two buddies that are into it. And all of a sudden, like you have this, this system or or like this network of connections from, from nothing, you know, from just kind of putting yourself out there. It's unbelievable. The return. (laughs) Oh yeah. No, that that's exactly it. It's really, yeah. And then once you're kind of surrounded by individuals, right? And not so much that they think alike, but they have the same goals, right? You guys have things in common, maybe outside outside of just going out <laughs> and getting <laughs> and, and partying. Um, you've got you know a lot of things in common. Well, then I, I think you really start building very strong connections, and it starts reaffirming, hey, you know, maybe if you had questioned whatever it is that you were gonna, you know, you were initially reaching out to do, if you had some hesitations. I'm, I'm thinking about it purely from a real estate lens because a lot of people they want to get into real estate, but they don't know what that first step is. But once you start talking to other people who have done it, you realize, hey, you know what? You know, John's not the brightest guy, but he bought a house. Maybe I could buy a house. Like <laughs> and that's and that's that's really all it is. It's like, all right, let's let's do this. We all can. <laughs> <laughs> No, you're honestly right, man. Like it, uh, even like just meeting like one person or like one investor, you know, and like just the amount of value that that can come from even, like I said, you know, like one conversation, you know, from like talking to one person at one meetup, you know, like it, it's just unreal. You know, yeah. like I was at a, a meetup last night actually over in Worcester and literally, man, like I had my notes open the whole time, like literally just writing in like little things that like you just pick off, you know, and just kind of doing something like that all the time, you know, just like continually building that knowledge and like going to hear everybody's story. And that's, that's what I really enjoy, you know, is like just kind of reaching out to people and like having fun, like just to, just to hear what they're doing, you know? And like, it's just, it's so interesting. Like, cause everybody's off in like a million different directions, especially, you know, in like the, this space and even like real estate investing, you know, like, it's not all like, you know, people flipping houses, you know, like, (laughs) but yeah, I mean, like just the, 
I don't know. Like, I feel like there's a lot of like satisfaction and value just from just talking, you know, and then from that, like one thing leads to another sometimes. And, you know, you never know. You might be meeting that superstar Boston agent. I forget what his name was. Uh, shout out. <laughs> Taylor, Taylor Johnson. Shout out to Taylor Johnson in Boston. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, I mean, like you might be going out for a beer or something. And then all of a sudden you have a multifamily like a month and a half later. Like, how the oh. hell does that work? Like, you know, it's unreal. No, nah, that's exactly it. I'm excited. I'm excited. You know, we're kind of trying, well, knock on wood, we're turning the, the corner on this. Um and getting back out into meetups again. Um, I, I didn't really do, I did a one or two of the Zoom ones, but it's, it's just very different. So I'm excited it to get is, back in person, yeah. start shaking some hands, you know, putting some faces, or at least, I, I, I guess I've seen the faces, but maybe a real life presence to the, to the names and voices that uh, we've been connecting with over for the past year and a half. Yeah, it really has been crazy, man. Like, you know, with some of the meetups just kind of starting again in the past, probably like six months ish, something like that, maybe less. Yeah. Um, you know, like just uh like shooting the breeze with people and stuff during um, you know, COVID and everything, like over Zoom, over phone calls, like Instagram, Facebook, like and just kind of, you know, watching what people are doing and stuff like that and like building the relationship there. And then yeah. when you can actually meet them, like now, now that things have started again, and like you said, you know, like match that, that face to that person, you know what I mean? And just kind of have that extra connection. It's really something special. You'll oh, be 100%. like, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's nuts. Like you might be um, watching, you know, somebody on Instagram, like an investor or something like yeah. in all of his projects and like shooting the breeze with them and you know, like interacting with this content, that kind of thing, like just really kind of building that, that relationship and, and egging them on to, to keep pushing, you know? And then as soon as you, you meet them in real life, it's like, Oh dude, no way. Like I've been talking to you for six months, but this is the first time I've seen you in real life. You know, it's yeah. something crazy. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. How's your house hunt going? I know you, you've been looking. Uh, it's been going okay. So I actually just had one um, that I had under contract. It was a three family in Lowell. Oh, nice. But I went uh, to the inspection. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I went to the inspection last Sunday and there was some pretty heavy structural damage. It was built in like 1900 and literally like the walls were like this. Like, and I didn't even really notice it going in, but. Oh my God. Yeah. So like, that's something that I just kind of picked up on, you know, as, as I guess, kind of common sense as it sounds, you know, to see if from the outside, if the walls are straight, you know, oh, like, but um, yeah, like I go in and, uh, you know, we're w walking through the house and everything. It would definitely need some updating. I mean, not a lot, but mm -hmm. you know, it would need some TLC and, uh, you know, some fixes here and there, but, and then we get to the basement. Well, <laughs> yeah, there was, uh, literally like a lot of the joists in the basement were like a couple inches off of where they were supposed to sit so like they were oh. literally like this and i was like uh, that ain't right that's not right <laughs> so it was, i kind of bit off a little bit more than i could chew with that yeah. um but i mean now i know you know what i mean like that was it was a lot bigger than than what i anticipated um but yeah i don't know just kind of you know stepping back and and just kind of like taking that for what it was and taking some lessons from it and everything and and just kind of re-evaluating the strategy and probably dropping the price point a little bit but yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey man there's time there's time now that i feel like we're going getting out of the summer market you know going to the fall and winter i'm just hoping hey well at least i'm seeing it some of the prices are coming down a little bit and yeah. hopefully there's just something that you know someone has overlooked for the past month or two um and get in there and scoop one up same for you as well. I'm hope I'm hoping. So you're, you're looking primarily a little bit north north of the Boston area, north of Boston Metro. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. I mean, like I'm starting to kind of spread. Well, I've had my net spread out for a bit, but I mean, like Lowell is kind of like my go-to market because I'm over in uh, Tuxbury, mm -hmm. so that's like the next town over, like border in Lowell. Um, gotcha. So I mean, like I'm in Lowell a decent amount, um, and I just I really like that market. I do. Um, but yeah, yeah I mean it is kind of starting to get on the pricier side. Um, yeah. So, you know, I've spread out to like, you know, like the Lemonsters, like the Haverhill's, mm. um, Clinton's, you just kind of, you know, spread out as much as possible and, and check out some different things. Yeah. What sure. about yourself, man? 
Um, so yeah, so she kind of, for the audience, I'm primarily just within, I would say within Metro Boston um, is where I'm looking. Yeah, so it's pretty much directly north of the city, uh, Malden, Everett area, Medford, Somerville, and then a little south. So then we're looking at Dorchester, Quincy, Braintree, um, and then I would say actually west too. Yeah, pretty much a circle around Boston Metro, and then you basically it would be Brighton, couple of couple of Newton, Waltham, and that's about it. Um, that's pretty much it. So pretty much with everything within a ninety five loop of uh, of Boston. Uh, looking primarily, we've primarily been looking at two fams. Mm -hmm. um two fans um not as much uh, at, at threes because um there's better opportunities to i at least based on how i understand it, i could totally be wrong um to get into a two fam and refi out of that at a um at a higher ltv as opposed to three fans i think three fans you usually have to get to a 75 percent ltv with two fans I, I think i've i've talked to lenders that are willing to do it at 90 or 85 oh, wow. which i mean in this market Listen, you knock on wood, it keeps going the way it's going. If you have a house already, I, uh, it's up, you know, for me, 10% year over year, which is crazy to think about. Um, but even if that's not the case, uh, the reason we're looking at twos versus threes is just that um, the, the lower LT, or I guess the, yeah, I guess the, the lower amount of equity required uh, before you, you can refi. That's awesome. Yeah, I, honestly, I feel like that's a really big, um, really big thing that that's kind of overlooked you know especially if you're looking to kind of use that one as a stepping stone to keep going on to other ones is exactly. that kind of like your strategy like a buy and holds like two family or like is that just kind of like right now like in the future are you trying to go into like threes fours and then like just kind of build up or just yeah, kind of uh, work with us <laughs> that's something i consider i think earlier on was like oh i think you're really cool and really sexy to do these big syndications and you know big dollar signs and so on and so forth. And I think I'm just too early now to, to actually be as confident as I was when I first started. And, and I say that because, again, I don't believe all syndications are this way, right? I'm sure you could syndicate and, and do a longer term hold. But for the most part, you're, you're going in, it's, it's a, a shorter period, the commercial loans, the terms are obviously shorter overall, overall time length. And, and so yeah, I don't know if it necessarily fits, I guess, with the thesis that we're going after, which is really just having a handful of properties of peace and sit on them. I, yeah. I mean, let, let's be honest, 30 years from now, it's going to be crazy to think about it, but likely what we have is going to be worth significantly more, right? And, and so in and thinking about it in that way, in the Boston market, hey, get, get yourself two, three, two fams over the course of your investing career, sit on them. Boom. golden if yep. you want to talk about a retirement plan there it is continue working your day job <laughs> but there, there there's right there's your retirement there's your 401k there's your pension boom right there. um yep. <laughs> and yeah and especially again for, for folks that are even even if you aren't you know i i guess fresh out of college and you know you might have a, a little bit more working uh experience under your belt it's never too late it really is never too late i, I think more now more than ever more and more people are talking about real estate they're getting educated on real estate they understand the value of real estate and so go in early buy if you could buy one property every decade of your life, I think that boom, you're you're in a good spot. One hundred percent. It doesn't. And again, I think the Boston market is tough because it is expensive. Like let's let's call, let's call a spade a spade. I mean, the Boston market, especially if if you're in Metro Boston, you're right five five on a no five on a two fam is unrealistic. Like six six on a two fam, seven on a two fam, really eight on a two fam, eight hundred thousand that is. Um, and so I will, you know, I do want to acknowledge that. Yes, that is, a, you know, if you're coming down with 10, 15% down payment, that is a ton you're going to have to come up with year over year. But if you only have to do it once every 10 years, you, you know, get creative, get some side hustles, do something, whatever it is, come up with the capital, cloud into real estate, you're golden. I, I was thinking about it the other day. It's crazy. You think about real estate as an investment vehicle. You, if I were to tell you, hey, Kyle, I want to invest $500,000. Um, but I'm going to borrow from you 400,000 of it and only give you a hundred and I'm going to go take it and I'm going to invest it in the stock market as a bank. No, you'd say, John, what are you talking about? No, you give me the money and you go invest it. Whereas with real estate, I mean, you use an FHA loan, put three and a half percent down on a million dollar property. Uh, yeah, on a million, on a million dollar three fam. Technically there's limits to the FHA, but as a theoretical yeah. example, <laughs> if you put three and a half percent down on a million dollars, thirty-five thousand dollars, 
to invest like a million. That's Hell yeah. crazy. <laughs> like that is that is leverage in a nutshell, ladies and gentlemen. No bank is going to just willy nilly give you nine hundred and sixty five thousand dollars to go invest after, if you give them thirty five thousand return. That's that's just not going to happen. And so, <laughs> like once you kind of realize that, it's like oh, wait a minute, I am playing with serious money. Well, that's not mine. It's not mine. But but if I you know, do it. If I do it right, I own or occupy it, I rent it out, I house hack it, whatever it is. At the end of the 30 years, someone else has paid for that, not me. Yep. Boom. That's it. It's yeah. I, I think I was, I was thinking about my parents' house, maybe, yeah, it was pretty early on. I think it was maybe like a year or two after college. And I was like, it's crazy. The amount of like interest that you pay right on a $500,000 loan over 30 years is like maybe 300 K. Like, Something on, crazy. Yeah. it's insane. Like, that is so crazy to think about. But the minute that you have someone else paying that, oh, it's whatever. okay. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. But I, I'm not paying for it. So <laughs> I, yeah, I would definitely implore anyone who's just fresh out of college, dude, instead of renting with your roommates, go buy a property and rent out to your roommates. I mean, that's, yeah, that's something I definitely would have done sooner. Though granted, when I wrapped up college, I just moved home. So would have been tough to, uh, <laughs> to tell my parents I was buying the house and charging them rent. <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure it's been this, done that's right. yeah i have this amazing idea sell the house to me <laughs> hear me out <laughs> yeah hear me out hear me out <laughs> generational wealth no it's uh <laughs> but really though it's it's real estate amazing vehicle amazing leverage as long as it's handled appropriately it really is john it, it really is like no other you know yeah. honestly like and uh i just want to tap on this real quick um so I know, so I did, uh, which there's a point to this. So I did like a year of community college and it was supposed to be like a, you know, a two year associates. And I decided after a year that I was done. So I started going back into my day job, uh, you know, doing HVAC or whatever. And I figured I was like, oh, you know, the bank needs two years of income, you know, to be able to pre-approve me. So I was like, all right, you know, that's yeah. yeah. August of 2021 that I was just kind of thinking. And I was talking to uh, an investor on Instagram, actually. Um, shout out to Nate Swift. <laughs> and uh, literally changed everything, man. It's again, you know, tapping back to what we were talking about before. Like one little conversation can change the trajectory of everything. Mm. He was telling me, he's like, dude, you're ready. I'm like, what? He's like, like, you're ready to, you're ready to get pre-approved. I'm like, what are you talking about, man? I'm like, I had like a, a year in at this point. Yeah. He's like, talk to your lender, which guys definitely talk to your lender about this. I, I'm not a lender, but just letting you know that this worked for me. Like you're able to get pre-approved from using a year of full-time college as well as a year of working income W2. Now, again, you know, talk to your lender about like how that works specifically. Like, you know, if you're doing a four-year school or wherever your situation is. But what I'm saying is like, uh, you know, to your point, John, like right after college, like buying a house might not be too far away, you know? And even um, like in the past week, like I was digging a lot into like the down payment assistance kind of stuff. There's a lot of ridiculous programs out there, you know, to be able to get into like singles, duplexes, three families, you know, and mixed with, you know, like, like you said, like a three and a half percent down loan it doesn't sound so crazy, you know, right after you get out of college, like it, it's probably a lot more possible than you think it is. It's just a matter of, you know, kind of finding the people and talking to the, the loan officer and stuff and, and seeing how to make it happen. You know, like guys, hop on bigger pockets. If you're in college, it just, just give it a shot. <laughs> Check it out. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly it. And if you're in any of these metro areas, right, West coast, East coast, some of these loan programs say, Hey, We'll give you this loan, you know, three percent down. Maybe, maybe they might even, you know, say no mortgage insurance. Maybe I don't know. I think there are some like that. I'm not positive, but the income requirements are eighty percent of the average median income. Which for certain like zip codes in Boston, I looked it up. It's like a hundred thousand dollars, which is bonkers. Like you think like, oh, you know, like I really have no. Like it is like pretty wild of how high that like barrier, quote unquote, yep. is. So, so absolutely, you got it. Think creative. It's not always the conventional 20% down. If you want it, there's definitely ways to do it. And here's the other thing I would say, especially when it comes to talking to lenders, talk to one until you hear the right answer. Um, I'm a huge proponent, if we're going kind of back into kind of life philosophy and all that, uh, of 
basically you don't get what you don't ask for. And if, if you don't like what you hear, just ask again. Um, when it comes to talking to lenders, I would say I probably talked to, ooh, probably 10. I probably talked to 10 lenders saying, hey, I want to buy multifamily FHA in Boston. Nine of them said, don't do it. No way. 98% of my loans are conventional. Maybe I do 2% FHA. Not happening, kid. Until I found the right one. Also, this was a referral from uh, my amazing agent, Taylor Johnson. So <laughs> yeah, <right? laughs> yeah. So, so it's like on two points, like, yeah, build a network, but then you just got to keep asking until you hear the right answer, because I, I'm hearing people are buying FHA. I mean, uh, are buying multifamilies using three and a half percent down, even though people are saying, oh, it's not competitive. You know, you'll never win. I mean, case in point, here I am. And so when you talk to your lenders, if you know that something has, someone has done whatever it is you're looking to do and your lender is not telling you the right thing, thank you very much. And move on to the next one because there are a plethora of lenders and agents out there and if you don't gel and you don't mix and they're not fitting into what you want to do thank them for the time and just move right on it was crazy I, I talked to this guy he literally laughed and was like oh i've only done like two fhas last year and i was like okay all right, all right. <laughs> guess we're not working together then and that's it it's, it's it's as simple as that like hey listen if that's not what you want to do that's fine i talked to another lender the one i worked with i think he over 60 or 60, 60 or 70% of the loans he touches are FHA loans. And they're both from the same bank. Believe it or not, I mean, it's a really big, actually it's a mortgage brokerage. But believe it or not, it's a big mortgage brokerage and they're both from the same one. One says, no way. The other one says, oh yeah, that's actually a ton of my business. So well, yeah, when it comes to speaking to lenders, when it comes to speaking to anyone in life, it's general life philosophy. If, if you know what you want and what you want is realistic, ask until you hear the right answer. <laughs> That's a huge point, man. And I like how you said, like, just to life in general, you know, oh, like, yeah. uh, especially for, uh, you know, like loan officers and lenders and stuff like that. Like, guys, so there's not just like a couple loan programs out there. Like, it's not like it's, you know, like just FHA or conventional. The more loan officers or the more lenders that you talk to, you're going to find some really crazy programs out there. Like stuff that like, you know, like the vast majority of people like just aren't really talking about in daily conversation, you know, like there's, there's just a, a ridiculous amount of value in, you know, just having lots of conversations and, and just meeting a lot of different lenders and, and just talking, you know, and like, like you mentioned, John, just to kind of talk about like what your goals are and stuff, you know, one guy might tell you, you know, it's a pound sand and he's only done that once or twice. Mm -hmm. And like five more people might do that too. But you only need one yes. Yeah. You know, and then you're good. Like the rest of them doesn't matter. That's exactly it. That is exactly it. And just to bring it back one more time, I mean, you know, my my example I always tell people is when it comes to applying for credit cards, sometimes you'll get accepted, sometimes you'll get denied. Now, there are certain reasons as to why you might be denied. Like if you're denied because your credit score is too low, I'm sorry, unfortunately, that's a true denial and you're going to have to work on that. Yeah. But if it was denial for a reason where the bank is like, oh, you know, you might have opened like, I don't know, a couple of cards, or you have too many increase or some reason where it seems fluffy, call and ask for reconsideration. There is one bank, Chase Bank, where I spent an hour across three agents. So three hours total over the course of a day, not sequentially, basically asking to be reconsidered for an application, which I knew I was qualified for. Yeah. There was some issue where they were miscounting one of my cards, and but I won't get into it. Basically, I knew what I needed and I knew what I wanted. I just needed to ask. Yeah, the first agent, I talked to him for an hour. He said, sorry, I can't push it through. Second agent, exact same thing. It wasn't until I spoke to the third agent that she was like, oh, actually, no, you're right. Actually, there's this weird technicality where we're miscounting an authorized user card and we can just move some of your balance over. You're approved, Mr. Liang. And so that was technically actually, I went through what? I went through three rejections, a system rejection and two agents before I got the fourth acceptance. And that's really the case across pretty much anything, right? So just, you just got, just got as long as, you know, you're within reason yeah. that you think you're right. <laughs> you, you, yeah, don't be obnoxious about it, but just, you know, and if it doesn't work, my favorite saying is, you know, Haka, hang up and just call again. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't know you could do that with when you were opening credit cards. I, I only have one credit card myself for now yeah. until I look into the uh, the Sapphire card. <laughs> but, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know you could do that, though. I mean, nice. I guess it does kind of make sense. You know, I mean, you never really know until you ask, ask for the why. You know, you hear it on like the Bigger Pockets podcast all the time. You know, like David Green says it a bunch, you know, just, to, you know, to get that answer, like no or whatever. You're like, all right, 
why you know and then like the answer might not actually be that crazy yeah or yeah. you know like you uh just alluded to a couple minutes ago just asking like a couple different people the same question no 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 yeah let's do it you that's know? exactly it that's exactly yeah with, with the credit card stuff it's just called a reconsideration and you're basically just saying hey like yeah, you're asking kind of why, and then you have a little bit of a story. Like, you know, I'm interested in the card because I want to travel, or I'm interested in the card because I want to start a bank relationship. I'm interested in the card because I want a business. Yeah. And the amazing thing is most of the rejections that you're going to get from a credit card, it's automatic. But the person who might approve you, it's actually a person looking at your profile, and you're telling them a story, right? So you tell a compelling story, you get the nod. I had a buddy apply for a Chase Inc. card, um, which is the business card. They came back with four reasons of why they denied him. And I was like, oh. This is a laundry list. All right, we're going to go to battle, but I don't know if we're going to win. I mean, it was a laundry list. It was uh, too many cards in the last six months. It was looking for too much credit. It was business not established enough. And, and I forgot the fourth one. And I was like, all right, we're going to say, you know, this, 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 and the other thing. I was like, it, and I was like, you know, I was confident. And I was like, ah, we're good. We're good. And in the back of my head, I'm like, oh, I don't know, man. This is a lot. <laughs> and so yeah. he calls, he calls him, he calls him. He's like, I'm on the line now. I'm like, all right, good luck. And within like five minutes, he said, yeah, they approved me. I was like, Oh, awesome. Like, okay. how was it? Like, did you like, did you go to battle? Did you like address one by one? He's like, no, they just asked me a couple more questions about my business and uh, they approved me. Sweet. <laughs> Absolutely. Painless. So, so that's just another example. I mean, even when I was expecting like, oh, this could be tough, uh, yeah. it, it went through. Um, so to wrap it, kind of to summarize all of it. Yeah. When you're talking to lenders, you're talking to agents, you're talking to anyone in the real estate world, if they're not getting you what you want, eh ask and then move on <laughs> yep. there's a lot of them out there <laughs> yeah you're gonna get your answer somewhere that you're looking for exactly as long as it's realistic ish <laughs> yeah exactly yeah as long as it's within reason it, it, within your reason right i mean people have yeah. different definitions of reason but <laughs> <laughs> yep i couldn't agree more john Ooh, what values are most important to you when it comes to doing business i know oh. we talked about at least a couple already <laughs> yeah I, I mean just be honest and do what you say you're going to do i think that's the biggest if people especially in business right whether again whether it's real estate or, or whatever it is i mean in my business like in my day-to-day -day job um you know in the sales profession do what you're going to do i mean do what you say you're going to do right if you're going to send a follow-up do it if you're going to make an offer if the property takes all these boxes then make the offer um because once people know that they can rely on you and trust on your word you're good you are golden right yeah you know i think this this um sorry i lost my train of I'm trying to thought here but okay. <laughs> uh, yeah oh i i was kind of kind of allude to you know i think back in the day like in the 1800s 19 1900s it was oh yeah you know someone's sense of honor yada yada i don't feel like that term gets used a bunch anymore but i think it's just switched a little bit into just trust right can is this person trustworthy can i trust them um, and it's very much the same thing in, in business. If you are going to, if you do what you say you're going to do and people know that you're reliable, you're dependable and we can trust you, boom, you know, it's going to make your life so much easier. That's awesome. I love that. It like, it sounds so simple too, but I feel like it's so like kind of few and far between, you know, like you just have to kind of find the, the right people. Yeah. It, it can be tough because sometimes you might just say something and be like, oh, man, do I really just volunteer myself to do that? <laughs> oh, all right. All right. I need, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Then yeah. just really volunteer myself to summarize this. All right. I, that's on me. I'm going to send it. I'll do it. <laughs> uh, it. It sucks the first couple of times, but like once you start again, right, kind of building that trust with yep. whoever's on the other side, then it becomes, you know, the, the relationship develops. And, and so, yeah, it, it might, yeah, you, you might inadvertently volunteer yourself for some things to follow up on and do, but trust me, just, just do it. it. It'll definitely make your entire working relationship, business relationship with whoever the other person is that much easier. A hundred percent. And the sky's the limit too, you know, from like meeting some of those people's connections and like even just making just that one connection, you know, for like a direct relationship or uh transaction or you know what have you but it's like the bigger picture like what could also come out of that from having that great relationship with that person mm -hmm. you know like you you really never know you know like just from like being a good person and and just you know just making that a nice solid relationship helping each other out and everything and the sky's the limit you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep but yeah, John, I could talk to you for hours, man. Thank you very, very much for coming on the show. It uh, it really was a pleasure to have you on. Um, yeah, no, where on uh, on social media can you be found? I'll link yeah. everything below. Everything. 
we'll keep it simple. Uh, check just check it out on YouTube at John Liang, L I A N G. Personal finance, travel hacking, avoid travel, um, all that good stuff. Guys, check out John. He has an absolutely. Actually, I'm going to actually plug another one. I just got on oh, it the other day, actually. TikTok, John's finance tips. Nice. That's, that, that's a new one. Got to, got to, got to stay hip with it. How has TikTok been working for you? I, I've like really wanted to get into it because of the, like the organic reach and everything, but I just, I don't know. It, it hasn't been at like the front of my mind, I guess. <laughs> oh, big fan. I'm a big fan of TikTok. Um, because the algorithm is very different. The YouTube algorithm, you definitely need to start, you need to, again, with everything you need to make quality content, but YouTube I think is not as willing to just push you out to people, whereas TikTok 100% is. I mean, it, it's kind of crazy if you think about it, um, that TikTok, I mean, their whole thing, right, is, and I think it's brilliant because once you get a creator who maybe has a video that does well, it's, it's a hit, it's like a rush. And the creator wants to make another video. And on the same side, their algorithm is amazing for users. So I think TikTok's kind of figured it out. I mean, I, I, I completely submit. Um, I've, <laughs> I've been good about not actually scrolling it because you could probably doom scroll that for days. But on the yeah. creator side of it, I think it's really good because yeah, it does a really good job of, of putting your content out there and getting you a pretty wide um, reach. I think how it works is like, it'll sample it to hundred people. And if that does well, then it just goes. Oh. So definitely, definitely check it out um, because yeah, I, I was absolutely shocked at, at the type of traction that I was able to gain um, very shortly. And again, I'm not doing anything special. I was like, oh, okay, interesting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a, a really, really crazy platform. Uh, I'll, I'll have to kind of jump onto it a little bit more. Guys, yeah, definitely follow John on TikTok as well. <laughs> yeah. If you don't see the video come up in your feed, just because yeah. it's awesome. <laughs> if you do, Nice and uh, easy. Perfect. Appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> but yeah, thank you again, John. That, that really was awesome, man. All right, guys, that concludes our Creating Wealth podcast episode for today. I want to thank every single person that has listened this far. It really means a lot to know that people can learn from me and with me as we build wealth together. Hopefully you can take home at least one thing from this podcast that will improve your life just a little bit. If you could, please check me out on social. That's at Kyle Curtin Real Estate on Instagram, Facebook, and I'm on Bigger Pockets. Until next time, let's build together.